Q&A time. Post your questions down below and let's begin. Hey Alex, how many days rest do you need before working that muscle again? All depends on your program. Are you doing a high frequency system where full body is performed every single day? Or what if you're doing a push-pull legs and upper lower? In that case, you got twice a week muscle protein synthesis. What if you're doing full body every other day? You see, there's no black and white answer to this. All I could really say is that on average, you should probably get about 48 hours of recovery. I think that's most feasible for the majority of people. And a good routine to employ that is a heavy, light, medium, full body sit-up, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If not, you can try a different approach, which is what you would see in an upper lower routine, 72 hours rest. I think that works very effectively. So Monday, you can do an intensity upper, Thursday, volume upper, and it'd be the same thing in full body. So it all depends on the program, man. But I'm gonna say generally speaking, 48 to 72, that seems to be the magic sweet spot where you feel really, really good. But honestly, you can train every day if you choose to. You just gotta manage your volume correctly. Not overdo it with the fatigue, not overdo it with going to failure, the percentages, all that. So that's my answer. Hi Alpha, eating well for gains in a very low budget, like 100 euros per month for food. What do you recommend? Greens from Portugal. Well, my friend, I would recommend a whole food, minimally processed, plant-based diet. It's very inexpensive. Get yourself a gigantic bag of lentils and various beans in addition to rice. And just have that every single day in different varieties. So day one, it could be just standard rice and lentils. Day two, rice and black beans. And you constantly rotate the beans. <laughs> Concurrent periodization with food, if you will, right? And for your micros, get yourself a gigantic bag of uh, frozen kale or spinach or just mixed veggies in general. And then get some frozen berries as well. And you can make smoothies with that. It's easy to down. Like, that's what I would do. Or just protein powders as a whole. Like, you'd be surprised, man. It can be more expensive to buy a bunch of meat compared to protein powder if all you want is the protein content, okay? You're not going to get all the micronutrients and all that, but... From a muscle gaining standpoint, you'll still be fine. Then, of course, there's your fats, right? I don't really recommend it from a health perspective because you might be too up there on the omega-6s. Plus, fat is like, you don't really need to have a lot of it, right? 10, 20% is all you need. But if you're trying to bulk up and you're struggling to get your calories in, then, you know, have a bunch of olive oil, man, or just coconut oil. But I really don't recommend that because it's saturated fat content. But nonetheless, it's a good uh, mass gaining tool. So that's what I recommend, man. Mainly whole food plant-based. And if you want to have animal products, um, have ground beef mainly, way less expensive than your standard meats and you can just mix it in your rice or whatever. Or just pasta too, pasta is very inexpensive, but again, not the healthiest choice. So there you go, that's what I recommend, man. What are your thoughts on the barbell hip thrust and how would you program them? I think they're great for building up the glutes, although I don't do a lot of them personally because I'm happy with my development. But if this was a lagging area for me, I would definitely go ham on this exercise. And I think that Brett Contreras made enough videos and articles discussing the benefits. So I don't feel the need to parrot him in today's segment. So you can look into his work. He's pretty much the master of this movement, right? And in terms of programming, it's kind of tough to say, like, because with concurrent, yeah, you're rotating the variations, but how many variations of hip thrust exist? You can play around with your foot stance a little bit, pausing, no pausing you know, alternating between that and the glue bridge and even adding bands or even doing it on certain machines. But beyond that, there's not a lot you could do, I would say. So I would say more so a, a DUP setup or just standard linear progression if possible. Alex, you have a general warm up before your training sessions like band pull apart, shoulder dislocations, and maybe some cardio to get the blood pumping. I don't do cardio before my workouts. And in terms of the other stuff you mentioned, sometimes, but usually no. Although I'm really considering including the winning warm-ups into my routine. If those who want more information on that, check out the full interview I did with Matt Winning. You're really, really, really missing out if you haven't seen it already. So it basically includes some 4x25 right before the main work. And this is supposed to build your work capacity in the long run. It acts as a form of GPP, and it gets you more jacked and strong eventually. So short-term, you won't see the benefits right away, but in the end, it's worth it. So that's what I plan on doing, but right now, my warm-up is just empty bar, Get that 5, 10 reps, maybe two sets of that. Then you gradually start adding weight. You do 135, 225, two and a half, three plates. And you just keep going from there. So that's all I can really say, man. For me, my warm-up is the bar itself, adding weight. Hey, Alex, what's a good way to incorporate some explosive Olympic movements, clean, jerks, and agitate? Novice was program or any similar size and strength program. I'm going to address your first point. My novice program is not designed for Olympic lifting. That's the furthest thing from it. And I won't even attempt to include those exercises because... That's not the purpose. I suppose the closest substitute you can make is replacing the penalty rows for power cleans, as you saw in uh, starting strength. But I don't recommend it. Snatches and jerks, nah, bro. It's not for my novice program. And in terms of including other routines, I have to be honest in saying that this is my area of least expertise. It's not something that I care about or have looked into very much. I read the book, Managing the Training of Weightlifters, but beyond that, I'm really not the right guy you should be consulting for advice on those exercises. It's just 
it's not my domain, man. But I'll help you get stronger other stuff. If you want to include calisthenics in my knowledge program, I know how to do that. But Olympic lifting, you came to the wrong channel, my friend. Do you think the weighted pull-ups alone are enough to get the one-arm pull-up? Maybe. But I would say for most people, they're probably going to have to include specialization training for they're still doing negatives and isometrics and all that. Please check out my one-arm pull-up tutorial. But I would say this, right? If you do 75% of your body weight for one rep max on the weighted pull-up, you probably already have the strength to do a one-arm pull-up. Logically, that would make sense. And if you do even more than that, then I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do it. Like, let's say you weigh 180 pounds and you can do 180 dead hang with a fucking pause at the top way to pull up. I'd be inclined to say that you can get a one arm pull up on your first attempt without doing any specific training because weighted calisthenics is legit as fuck. This is what I keep trying to tell people. It's the ultimate shortcut to unlocking skill mastery and just becoming an ultimate badass. There's this one guy on YouTube. I don't remember his fucking name. But he did a Maltese on his first attempt. He was a weighted calisthenics beast. Some people claim that I'm lying about that, but it's on there. It's on YouTube. I forgot the guy's name. So this will give you crazy strength on all levels. That's what it's all about, general strength. So I would say it's possible, but unrealistic for most. Alex, what's your opinion on band push-ups where the band goes around your back and you hold them with your hands? Never heard you talk about them. Love the content, by the way. They're all right, but I find them to be limited in terms of weights used, and it's doesn't feel as comfortable compared to having a weight plate on your back or an actual person or just taking a weight belt, putting it across your chest and doing push-ups that way. It's probably the most awkward feeling one of all. Although I'm sure there's a way to do it in a way that makes more sense. Like maybe attaching it to a power rack. Now we're freaking talking. So in terms of the exercise itself, yes, it's effective. Yes, if you induce progressive overload, it's great. And if you're just trying to do push-ups as a volume tool, I think the band is a viable method for many but I personally prefer the weight plates on the back or, or just other styles. Alex, I'm currently a novice following your program. I sometimes feel sore and still go to gym. Is this a detriment to my gain? Should I skip a day if I feel sore? No, don't skip a day, man. That's completely normal and most of you who run a novice program will get sore at the start. For the first two weeks, your legs will be in excruciating pain, upper back, chest, triceps, everything. But once you get over that initial hurdle, you're good. See, soreness is usually caused by a lack of frequency. And in my program, you're squatting three times a week. So your legs aren't gonna be that sore. At times, you might get a little bit sore. if You're pushing yourself very hard. But in most cases, there shouldn't be any problems. So I say, don't stress about it. And I'll say this too, you can be recovered, but still a bit sore. And by skipping that workout, you just missed out another five pound PR. You can totally go in on Monday, get 225 on your squat, right? Wednesday, you come in sore as fuck, but you still get 230 for five. It's very realistic, it happens all the time. So the way that I would base your gains is are increasing the weights. If you can't do that because of the soreness, now we can talk about recovery. Now we could say, okay, maybe the volume is a little bit too high, you should drop it. Or perhaps you should increase the calories or sleep more. But if it's just soreness and you're still making gains, you have nothing to worry about. Alex, your opinion on sitting over at press versus Z-Press. I too have a low ceiling gym. I've been doing the sitting over HP. If you can pick one over the other to focus on aesthetics, which one would you choose? I would do both. It's as simple as that. Because with concurrent periodization, I'm always rotating the variations. And I feel that both have unique benefits. The Z-Press is going to be much more difficult at the lockout. Much more upper back stability is required. And you're starting off from the bottom. The standard seat over at press, you unrack first, lower to the chest. So you get that stretch reflex action. Plus, you usually have the back pad as well. Or if you're doing without the back pad, nonetheless, it's easier because you're in a more stable position. Z-press, when you're sitting down on the fucking floor with your legs down in front of you, you have to be a lot more tight and it's just more difficult as a whole. In fact, there are some people who can lift more on the seated OHP compared to the standing overhead press. But with a Z-press, you'll rarely if ever find someone who can do more than a strict press. I would say it's very, very, very unlikely. So I would do both and especially for you because you can't do standing OHP, right? So you need another variation beyond that. So do seated overhead press with the unrack first and then Z-press to complement it off the pins. You're going to get crazy fucking gains. That's another thing too. Seated OHP, it's just bang, 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 right? You get to pause it. You get to do touch and go. Z-press, usually you're doing off the pins. So there's different benefits for sure. Yo, Alex, you think it's possible to build muscle with home video exercises, P90X, and Sandy, etc.? Yeah, of course. I just don't think that you're going to be stupid jack following those routines. You're not going to look like a bodybuilder and you're not going to maximize your size potential. You'll get fit. You'll be in decent shape. You're going to be one of those guys who can handle a lot. You're going to have good conditioning and you're going to look pretty good. You take your shirt off at the beach. Yeah, you got a nice looking physique. It's all right. But you're not going to have that wow factor like, yo, this motherfucker is a hardcore lifter. 
You're just gonna be another fit guy who's in decent shape. And of course, you're still gonna have some muscles, but I would say if you ran my novice program, you're gonna be way more jacked than following those routines straight up. Just following a calisthenics program, stupid high volume or weighted calisthenics, I think you'll get much more muscle gains from that. But listen, if those are the programs that you like to do, it fits your lifestyle. And that's the type of physique that you like. Okay, you can look at the guys who do those workouts. That's pretty much what you're gonna look like, right? If you enjoy that, go ahead and do so, man. There's nothing wrong with it. We live in a fucking obese world. So by comparison to all these other motherfuckers walking down the street, you're gonna look a million times better. Good morning and front squat combo to build up the low bar. Interested on hearing that. I think that's a great idea, man. The front squat is a more difficult variation than the high bar and low bar. So it's automatically gonna have carryover and make you strong as fuck as a whole in terms of lower body performance and just general strength. Then the good mornings is a very posterior chain focused exercise, which will also build up your deadlift. And we can also argue that it's more specific to building up a low bar squat. So to me, you're reminding me of the West side system in a way, because it's all about rotating specific variations that automatically raise your competition exercise. In fact, that's what I recommend you do. My friend, how about you experiment with a bunch of good morning variations, rotate through those. And then for the front squats, the exact same thing, regular pause with bands off a box, all the good stuff. And even throwing in safety bar squats would be a good idea, by the way. Find variations that are difficult. And then when you go test your low bar, you're automatically going to be strong. And also from a bodybuilding perspective, you're covered as well. So to me, it's a very, very, very good idea. Seeing as there may be some risk to going really heavy on rack pulls, you think we could make the same gains or even better by doing the volume instead, but still on intensity days. Okay, if you're doing it on intensity day, you have to do five by five, right? And you're still going to be going rather heavy with that. So you're more so referring to a five by 10. I suppose that could be done on intensity day, but I more so refer to that on a volume segment. So listen, if you want to do rack pulls, but you don't want to go stupid heavy, don't do it on intensity day. Simple as that. Instead, treat it for volume work exclusively. And there are various approaches to this. I recommend transcendent training. So one set of hundred, that's brutal as fuck. Or you can do four sets of 25, five by 20, five sets of 10, lots of different stuff like that. Even 10 by 10 rack pulls above the knee are fucking brutal for building up those straps. So that's how I would do it personally. And you can stick to the range of 500 to 700 pounds. You don't have to do a thousand anymore. Okay. I used to think that was required in the past, but after careful analysis and experimentation, I came to the realization that that's not required. So does that still work though? Yes. If you want to cut out the volume stuff and just do heavy rack pulls, yeah, you're going to get great gains, but I still think you can get huge traps with the volume approach. From what weight one more max do you think we should start deadlifting twice a week and same about once? First of all, I'm not a big fan of high frequency deadlifts. I would much rather you do deadlifts once a week and then rack pulls or block pulls once a week. And for those, you could do more volume. And then of course you just hammer your weak points very hard and you do a lot of accessories and you're going to be fine. So to me, that is a superior approach from a recovery standpoint and just long-term injury prevention. I think you'll be much safer. So uh, that's my opinion. The less experience you have, the more frequent you could be. The more advanced you are, the more you should cool it on poles from the ground specifically. So I'm talking about deficit poles and just from the standard position. That's my opinion. You can disagree if you want. Listen, I'm not a competitive powerlifter. This is just general advice for strength training and injury prevention. I think that what I'm saying is definitely superior long term. You pull once a week from the ground, once a week off slightly elevated blocks. You're going you're, you're gonna to have so much better recovery. It's unbelievable. So to me, that's way more worth it from a bodybuilding and general strength perspective, but you do what you want. Hey, Alex, I don't have a rack in my gym without squats. What would you do to replace doing Bulgarians and lunges? That's pretty much it, bro. If you get strong at those two exercises, you're going to have crazy strong legs and they're going to look amazing. You can also do hip thrusts. You don't need a rack for that, right? So I'll definitely recommend all the unilateral stuff, uh, barbell on your back, dumbbells, the whole nine yards. And you can even do uh, leg pressing and hack squats. Those will get your legs jacked, contrary to what biased motherfuckers on the internet will tell you. A lot of bodybuilders swear by it. In fact, that some people will never do a squat in their entire life. They still have huge legs. So try that. I think you'll have no problem getting size whatsoever. You can also do all your deadlift variations. Trap bar is going to help build those quads. Behind the back is going to be more quad focused. Just doing poles in general is going to be helpful. Your RDL is going to build up those uh, glutes and hamstrings a lot. You know, just your conventional deadlifts, deficit poles, sumo. Lots of stuff you can do. Or what about Zercher squats? You can delve away from the ground, place it on your thighs. Boom. Now you can do Zercher full range of motion. Okay. This guy's about 15, 16% body fat. He wants to know if you should cut or bulk. Like he wants to get stronger, but you know, maintenance isn't really doing much for him and the strength is small. So let's talk about it. Listen, you know what you want, right? In truth you do, but I'll give you my perspective. I say cut down to 12% body fat. And then do a very slow lean bulk. Because it sounds to me like you're not happy being in a fluffier state. 
So let's address that first. Let's get lean, right? You're not making strength gains anyway in the first place. It's very minimal. So fuck the performance. Fuck the size gains. You haven't made those right now. So it's not on your radar. Instead, get lean because you're going to be much more happy. I can tell by the way you're writing this comment. 12% body fat and then slowly, slowly, slowly bulk. This way you don't have to worry about getting fat. You're still going to maintain all your leanness. But the strength is going to go up nicely. And the size will pack on. You're not going to have these strength plateaus that you're experiencing because you're fearful of gaining weight. So lean down and then lean bulk. Very, very, very small surplus. See my video, efficient weight gain is the answer. I think you're gonna be perfectly covered, my man. So hope it helps you out. Okay, this guy wants to know how to shorten full body workouts because it's taking forever. So he usually does a push pull legs, you know? And he wants to know how to do this without lowering the rest intervals. Okay. Super sets and giant sets is what you should do. And you wanna push pull the full body, okay? So check out my recent volume workout for a good sample. Try that, but instead of going your overhead press first and then your pull-ups right after. Just superset the two, okay? And then if you really want to speed up the workout, you add another exercise as well. You add an accessory lift. And that could be an isolation movement. Look at Brian Alistair's channel for that. He has some very good samples that you could check out. So basically, push-pull, superset. You're going to cut the workout by 50%. It's going to be more draining. You will be tired. And your numbers might be lower as well. But if we're talking about efficiency, saving time, this is the way you're going to do it. So that's what I recommend. You don't have to cut the rest intervals back. Just so you can be going from one brutal compound to the next. And that can be quite draining, especially when you get to the lower body section. But that's how you do it. Any tips for the weighted neck curl? I'm literally failing because of my grip. For example, I'm neck curling 80 pounds, but can't get a decent grip on the waist because the 45 and 35 isn't even. If I put my hands through the plate, it crushes my wrist. Thanks in advance. Well, my friend, that's what happens for a lot of people when you're dealing with the weight plates. Like to me, the neck curl is the best exercise, but... When you get to a certain number, it becomes less feasible because of the grip. Like, depending on the plates themselves, it can be almost impossible. Like, when I was in Toronto, I tried doing neck curls 90 pounds, bro. The plates were so fucking thick that it became a grip exercise. So it wasn't even my neck that was a limiting factor. And, of course, with the rubbers, that could be very awkward. When you have 245s and you're grabbing by the inside, it's very, very strange indeed. And you feel your elbows a lot more as well. So not very feasible when you're going that heavy. The only people who get away with it, in my opinion are those who have like um, the smaller plates. They're a lot more thin. But you see me do that in the past, right? That's more feasible, but still not optimal because grip is a limiting factor. So what I recommend, neck curl with bands. I think that's the best variation you could do beyond the plate neck curl. And the best way to do this, in my opinion, is with the neck flex. Check out the MMB Pro model or just the standard version, right? And you can get all the resistance you'll ever need. And you can do high volume on that. Never have to worry about your grip ever again. And you can do your extensions and your side work and a bunch of other stuff that's going to help you get more yoke gains. So I'll provide a link in the description box. And yes, it's a little affiliate, okay? But it's honestly what I recommend if the grip is becoming a limiting factor and you want more gains. For bent over rows, is it okay to rest the bar on a rack after every rep to reset or is that considered cheating? I would just call that another variation, not cheating. What you've basically described is a pen lay row done off pins or a dead stop row or a pin row. That's what it is. And because of the heights of the rack, if you're doing it even from the lowest position, it becomes a little bit of a partial as well. But it's not a bad partial. Your body's a little bit more upright. So it saves the lower back more. And you're still going to get stupid strong. So to me, it's an excellent variation that will raise your deadlift automatically, raise your rowing strength as a whole, preserve the lower back, and of course, build that explosiveness and concentric strength. So to me, it's not cheating. It's just another style that's going to get you results. Try it out. Alex, I'm 17, 5'11", was 80 kilos in November at 20% body fat. I fall naturally enhanced to the dirty bulk to 110 kilos. Now I've leaned down to 93. I'm leaner than I was in November. Could this weight gain be muscle? I don't know what else it could be if it's not fat. Well, congratulations, bro. You made some serious fucking gains. Yeah, you acquired a lot of muscle. Now, you did do the dirty bulking style. So, I mean, shame on you for going the unhealthy route. But who am I to speak? I've done it too, right? And that's the thing. Like, what happened is you were able to focus on the training, you ran a good system, you used concurrent periodization, you managed volume intensity the proper way, you rotated special exercises, and you ate in a fucking surplus. You made all kinds of gains. Simple as that. You got fat in the process, you leaned down, you revealed all that muscle. What do you think I did, bro? I was bare mode for years. I finally cut down, revealed the aesthetics that were always there. Same thing. Now, you're basically saying that you were 80 kilos at 20% body fat, now you're 93, but leaner? That would be... Um, Probably too much muscle, in my opinion. I would say probably your age is a factor in this, being only 17 years old, and um, possible bloat as well, and maybe even the muscle glycogen. Like maybe you need to, um, maybe still holding on to some water weight and stuff like that. I don't think you gain like that much muscle. 
like 80 kilos and 93 while being leaner. How long did you do the fucking program, dude? That would be serious. Like if you actually pull that off, bro, that like, man, I, I think maybe you're not that much leaner than you think you are. Or perhaps you're a similar body fat percentage, but you have so much more muscle mass that you look leaner. Ever thought about that? Maybe you just change a little bit body-wise from going from 16 to 17. I mean, the age factor, it's definitely something to consider. But unquestionably, you gain muscle. I just don't think that's as much as you're claiming. How does bear mode pan out for a tall lifter compared to a stockier lifter? I think bear mode looks amazing on taller lifters. In fact, it's what gives you that Titan look. It's actually pretty fucking badass. When you're stupid jacked, tall, you've got the big beard as well, and you're fluffier. Do you know how crazy that looks? It's something else. Like if you want to really look impressive as a natural, this is how you do it. If I'm actually being honest, I would say that tall lifters look better than short lifters when they're bear mode. Because for us, we might look a little bit too much like meatballs, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like you look stocky, you look buff, but it's not quite the same effect. Like when you're tall and big, there's different perception associated with that. When you're short and just like this fucking stocky guy, but you're like too stocky and it's because the fat as well, it's like, it's different. Put it like that. And also your clothes won't, feel out the same when you're short. That's something that people don't think about. When you're bare mode, yeah, it's very tight around the clothes, okay? Very tight around the upper back, the chest, the arms, all that, right? But the problem is that you have to go a shirt size larger. And what happens now is it gets droopy around the waist. So the proportions aren't really the best for shorter guys. Whereas if you're tall, that's never gonna be a problem. As you upgrade the shirt size, it's just matching all this fat that's been accumulated around your already jacked frame. That said, no matter what your height may be, short, average, tall, bear mode is a great look. But I do feel that taller guys rock the best. Okay, last question of the week. I don't go to the gym. Would pike push-ups be a good substitute for overhead press? Absolutely. In fact, I might make a video on this soon entitled uh, The Calisthenics Shoulder Secret, where I talk about all the best shoulder movements from bodyweight training and how to get like crazy results. And the pike push-up is one of those movements. But it's not just a regular pike push-up. There's a modification that I've made, so let me know if you want to see that video. But yeah, definitely, man. If you do pike push-ups for high volume and especially a rest pause, you think you're not going to get some better shoulders? Like, of course. Would I compare it to overhead press? That all depends on the, the poundages used, man. Like, if the pike push-up forces you to plateau because of the lack of variations and the lack of progressive overload, then obviously overhead press can be better because now you're taking it a little bit further. And I would say that most people who achieve overhead press excellence will have bigger shoulders than most do uh, pike push-ups, on average. But to me, if you're overhead pressing the 200s compared to a random guy doing pike push-ups, I mean, it's pretty clear what the winner is. But like I said, there's other ways to spice up your body weight training so that you get crazy size and strength results. So I got more content on that. And with that said, guys, we're done this Q&A video. I thought the questions were amazing. Post more down below, and I will see you in the next one.